Greetings, everyone. This is Michael Nagler with your next episode of the Nonviolence Report. And as usual, I'd like to start off with a few resources, but uh, soon get over to the big event uh, that's going on in the nonviolence world today, which is the critical protest in Myanmar. So, as you know, the uh, Jains are probably the re religion which is most specifically dedicated to complete nonviolence. And the School for Jain Studies in India, which, which uh, I visited a few years ago, is offering a course, a July through April, actually, a long course on teaching peace. And teaching credit is available. That's why I mention it. It's online, of course. And the fee is $125 for those of you interested in teaching credit or getting in closer to the Jane approach to nonviolence. Now, much more locally, World Beyond War Organization has created a webinar with an activist by the name of Greta Zaro, and it's called Organizing 101. That's an important topic, organizing training and action for all of us. And so if you go on the World Beyond War website, worldbeyondwar.org, uh, you can go to their video, uh, Greta Zaro, on Organizing 101. Also, we're now around the anniversary of Martin Luther King's Breaking the Silence speech on Vietnam. And there is a group of really well-known, distinguished, nonviolent voices who will be talking about that speech and its importance for today. And the, the speech, of course, was called Breaking the Silence. And the website is kingandbreakingsilence.org. That's one word, of course, kingandbreakingsilence.org. Our friend uh, Kazu Haga, whose book on fierce vulnerability we have mentioned here a time or two, is giving a webinar on the 24th and 25th. It's a two-day webinar. And this comes from the network, which is still called the yet-to-be-named network. So I'm looking forward eagerly to the contest that's going to emerge uh, a new name. I will remind you that the term Satyagraha was developed in 1908 in South Africa by Gandhi to designate what he was doing there, what we now call civil disobedience within the general umbrella of nonviolent action, which is in the more general umbrella of nonviolence itself. And this webinar is called Bringing Fierce Vulnerability to the Struggle for Racial and Climate Justice. And although the network has no name as yet, unless yet to be named as a name, but you can find this webinar and register for it at eastpointpeace.org. They are the East Point Peace Academy, which mirrors the West Point War Academy on the East Coast. <laughs> One other resource I'd like to mention to you is our good friend Michael Beer at Nonviolence International has come out with a new book on the techniques of civil disobedience. He has upgraded the famous list of tactics that was originally promoted by Gene Sharp. Uh, I think I think if I remember correctly, Gene had 128 tactics. We've added a lot since then. Uh, Michael has added a good bit and has included a topic which was more or less absent from the original highly influential list, and that is the topic of constructive program, which we are constantly promoting at the Meta Center, and which does seem to be catching on. There was a book launch for it today. There'll be another book launch coming up soon. But if you go to Nonviolence International, or I think it's N-O-N-V-I-N-T-L dot org, uh, you will certainly be able to get to that book by Michael Beer. Now, there are a number of events that are happening, of course, in the nonviolence world. Thanks to a meeting with Black Lives Matter in Birmingham, famous city in the civil rights movement, the largest bank in Alabama 
Birmingham Regents Bank has just put an obstacle in the path of the governor who wanted to construct three new private prisons in the state. Private prisons can be done reasonably well, but they can also be a source of terrific uh, exploitation and violence. If you have any doubt about that, just read the diaries or the, the memoirs of George Fox, the founder of Quakerism, and what happened to him in 17th century private prisons in Britain. So uh, the bank is now terminating its relationship with an organization called Core Civic, which is a, quote, detention management group, and they're not providing them with financing for the construction of the prisons to be built in Alabama. And this announcement is part of their 100% commitment to creating more inclusive prosperity and advancing racial equality. So that is a very good step, and I think you can find it by going to Black Lives Matter in that region. Now, a couple of environmental things, one uh, U.S. and one Canadian. There is a group called ANOVA LNG, which is liquefied natural gas developer, and they were going to build a, an export terminal in southern Texas called the Brownsville Export Terminal, and that was a great concern to the indigenous people and to the environmental activist people who've been standing up against the proposed fracking gas terminal, which was to be. They have been standing up to that in various ways for the last six years. And uh, now for the corporation has announced that it will not go forward. Now, up in Alaska, I, I said Canada, but I was wrong. Up in Alaska, there's a group called Herring Protectors, and they gathered at the Sitka Courthouse this month to protest the proposed commercial fishing of herring in that area. The demonstrators are concerned about changes to the herring spawn and a species in decline. Now, it's nice that the fish forecast is higher than it has been since the 1970s. They understand that herring is a key organism in the ecosystem. The, all the life in the area is kind of dependent on it, as indeed they probably are all interdependent on one another. And they have a, this delicate balance in this ecosystem has been upset before, and they do not want to stand by and watch it happen again. So we wish them success for that. Now, this is Canadian. The Canadian government is planning to invest in 88 new fighter jets, and that will take up $77 billion in Canadian tax dollars. And so peace advocates across the country are organizing a day of fasting, followed by a candlelit walk in hopes of persuading the government to invest in their children's futures instead of in these killing machines. So I would like to comment on this. I think, of course, it goes without saying, this is an admirable cause. But they probably could use a better strategy, and there might be an opening here for talking about alternatives. Since this is not a fast unto death, the strict rules that Gandhi applied to that kind of fast don't apply here. And one of those rules, if you remember that list of five, we'll go over it sometime, one of them was that it should only be a last resort and not a first resort. However, if this act of fasting is for community solidarity among the activists and for strengthening their commitment and for reminding themselves that theirs is a spiritual struggle, then I would say it's a perfectly appropriate tactic to be using. So now I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about the struggle in Myanmar, and I will be getting some deeper analysis for you from friends of mine in that region at our next report, and I hope that by then things will have turned around. 
But at this moment, we were at a very critical point. Namely, the protesters have achieved significant victories, but the opposition has not cracked. In fact, hey, they have gotten more and more violent. Last Saturday alone, a hundred peaceful protesters were shot dead with live ammunition in Rangon. And it is now time for the movement to double down on nonviolent resistance. But there are understandably elements within the movement who are saying, well, now we have to take to armed struggle. We saw this very same crisis happen and be resolved successfully thanks to the influence and the authority of Nelson Mandela in South Africa. We are not aware that there is a single, should we say, charismatic uh, ruler or inspirer of this movement. That's one of the remarkable things about it. The person who would have been such a ruler, such a director, organizer, inspirer, is in jail. That's what started this whole thing off. That was the first thing that the regime did in the coup. Now, one of the reasons for this extremely intense standoff, which is reaching this unfortunate point of stalemate, which is causing a lot of bloodshed and no discernible forward progress, is the, the minds and hearts question. You know, somebody was saying about the Tulsa episode of 1921, that unfortunate massacre in Oklahoma where an entire black community was wiped out, saying about that, well, you can change the laws, you can change the policies, but unless you change minds and hearts, you don't get any forward motion. So it's minds and hearts that I want us to think about. And unfortunately, when a young person, a young male, is growing up, in Myanmar, they seem to face a pretty stark choice. They either become a Buddhist monk, if they're Buddhist, or they go into the military. And the military has one of the most strict, most thorough programs of indoctrination of any military we know of in the world. So once you are in the Tatmadaw, which is the name for the Burmese military, it's going to be very difficult to get you out of it, no matter how drastic are the human rights abuses and the kinds of cruelty that you impose. So one of the critical steps in nonviolent insurrection of this type, aimed at regime change against an oppressive regime, is the defection, what Gene Sharp used to call taking away the pillars of support from the opposition. And the police and the military are a critical pillar in that support structure. Now, there is an excellent article in Waging Nonviolence that just appeared this week by Maria Stefan, a co author, if you remember, of Why Civil Resistance Works, along with Erica Chenoweth. It's called Myanmar's Protesters have achieved significant victories, now is the time to double down on nonviolent resistance. Here's a quote from Maria. Mass nonviolent campaigns are 46 times more likely to succeed when there are widespread security force defections. And defections are much more likely in the context of nonviolent campaigns compared to armed struggles. So if the protesters, despite the oppression, if they continue varying their techniques, which they have been doing pretty well, they're avoiding those mass public protests, which make them so vulnerable. If they keep on looking for new strategies that way, and if they stick to their nonviolent commitment, they are likely to be able eventually even to crack that very hard nut. And there are a few security personnel, a few soldiers, career soldiers, who are now defecting. We're hearing reports from them. But this one is a very, very difficult struggle to accomplish. Another thing to be mentioned, because it's so typical 
of this type of uprising around the world today is the robust women's participation. That makes it even more problematic for oppressors. And the women in Myanmar have been on the front lines leading the movement for democracy and putting themselves at great risk. And as we all know, they have been killed. But here's a, f a final quote from Maria, Maria Stefan. The women's bravery and courage is, in part, meant to put the Junta's actions to shame. It's working, but it will take time. So I wanted to comment on that element of shame. It's a tricky one. If you can make a person ashamed of what they are doing, it is a very valuable strategy that often helps them greatly to stop doing it. However, if you make them ashamed of who they are, it only deepens the, and entrenches their resistance. So I am not close enough to the situation on the ground to know which proportion of which is happening here in this movement, but uh, one certainly hopes that, that they are stressing more you should be ashamed of what you're doing rather than you should be ashamed of yourself. That's a critically important psychological mechanism. So as mentioned before, in a couple of weeks, uh, or actually sooner, I will be bringing more information to you and more insight from protesters and others here in the U.S. about the Myanmar struggle as it unfolds. Thank you very much. Let's pray for those people and hope for the best till next time. Thank you.